Fuck it. It's Noah time. It's Noah call win time. It's time to bring on a guest, friend of the show, Saddam mustache wearing uh, Noah Colwyn on. Okay, it's been a long time. It has been a minute. Yeah, what's going on, brother? How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Um, I am uh, like happy that blowback season two is now starting to come out publicly and uh, a little unnerved by the headlines. But um, in general, things are good. Okay, well, I, I, I brought you here today for uh, an obvious reason, an obvious purpose, and that is uh, to, for you to tell us how much the people of Cuba hate the current administration, hate communism, and uh, want America to come in and fucking save themselves. Uh, right. Save so Cuba. I th I <laughs> well, um... I would start by saying that uh, the situation, like as like like it's it's all like very fluid, and and I think like sort of like the baseline understanding um, that we have, you know, that, that sort of at least like uh, that at least I've talked about with people I know in Cuba and other people who are who are watching this closely, um, you know, it's it's that there is. Uh, a real sense of concern and, and worry over the destabilizing effect that things like, you know, the, this like hashtag campaign has. Um, and, you know, obviously that like everybody from the U S government uh, official channels, like Joe Biden himself down to, you know, every like Republican elected that you can imagine um, as well as most Democrats, frankly, um, seems like it's really fucking concerning. It's, it's not good um, because, you know, like the, the basis of these protests as, as, as they're being called, um, is that there is a, you know, like there, there are vac uh, vaccine shortages and um, a lot of blackouts and, and other um, shortages of necessary supplies. And, you know, it's it's like there are like, all of that is true, except it's not for lack of trying in that, you know, Cuba has developed and plans to export uh, an effective vaccine that it was able to bring to trial. Uh, and then, you know, secondly, like th there is the 60 year uh, embargo slash blockade that effectively makes it illegal for Cuba for businesses to sell things to Cuba uh, in 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 most basic aspects. And so, you know, during times like a pandemic where you have a, com a country like, like Cuba that is reliant very heavily on tourism um, for its economy and you have a pandemic, you know, like like totally throw something like that out of whack. Um, you know, as as one of the people that we've interviewed for blowback says at one point, like you know, like fishers emerge, and and uh, as I think we uh, sort of talk about in our show, uh, the American government has a long history of exploiting those fishers when it can. So, um, do you want to briefly talk about the uh, like what encompasses the Cuban em embargo? Because uh, a lot of people in the chat and all over the internet. Uh, that uh, fancy themselves to be uh, neoliberal State Department employees that work for free for the American propaganda machine will say that uh, the Cuban em embargo doesn't cover medical supplies, actually, so you're wrong. It's not that crippling. It's just on wealthy people. I mean, this is something we hear about uh, the, the embargo on, on Venezuela as well and the sanctions on Venezuela as well is that, like, well, it's always just uh, directed towards the wealthy people who are the corrupt leaders uh, and, and no one else. So do, and, you, and do you mind talking about that a little bit? Yeah, I think that sort of like the, you know, in, in the first season of Blowback, we talked about Iraq and how the sanctions in the 90s, you know, um, like had crippled many of the essential institutions that, you know, were able to serve Iraqi society. Um, and, and, you know, a, a key point there, um, something that's not unrelated uh, or that you see also in Cuba is, you know, the destruction of the electricity system. And, you know, if you're a modern state, like everything from water filtration to, you know, obviously like, you know, telecommunications uh, depends on the functioning electrical grid. And also you have to have like the natural resources to power that electrical grid and so on. And so, you know, I, I think that in general, these sanctions, when people say that they're targeted, they're lying, uh, because the, the, if you look at the sanctions themselves, they, they say the, the legislation spells out quite plainly uh, just how not targeted they are, because if they were targeted, they wouldn't be effective. So it would be the point of having them in the first place. And, and, and you know, to, and to that point, uh, I think that, like, the embargo, you know, it's, it's worth sort of observing the history of what the embargo is and, and where it comes from, which is that, you know, the, like, the embargo was initiated by John F. Kennedy 
in uh as like you know this this like or, or rather sorry it was initiated by giant dwight eisenhower uh shortly before he leaves office and before kennedy uh is inaugurated and so for 60 years there's just been this like you know like like this thing in place that was initially introduced as we sort of talk about in our show as part of an escalation toward what was realistically going to be an invasion an american sanctioned invasion and counter-revolution in cuba and so it's like this instrument that we used as like a you know as, as, as a tool uh you know to prepare a country for an invasion um is still in place and it's you know if anything it's it's just like uh, it's fucking astonishing that cuban society has held together and that the cuban government and the cuban revolution has persevered in the way that it has under those conditions particularly once the soviet union was gone and cuba you know overnight lost like you know like like the like something i think like i want to i think like 80 percent of its uh imports and export like its, its primary trading partners are gone overnight and so I, yeah. I think that there is like a you know there's a standard that americans when they look at these protests that like you know they're conditioned like for whether or not the protests are legitimate is a separate question like when we see discontent in cuba we are inclined to lay it at the at the blame of you know like like we're, we're inclined to blame you know, the Cuban government and say, oh, look at that. We got to change things in Cuba, make it better for them, et cetera. But it's like, well, like, but no, th there's this thing that we're doing that we can change all on our own that would immediately improve the lives of the, you know, 11 million people who live there. And that would be to end the, you know, embargo slash blockade. The terms are used a bit interchangeably, although I guess technically it's just, it, it is an embargo. Yeah. Because a blockade is like a military, it's like involves like, but it's, you know, where words are fluid is the important part. Um, for the record, for those of, uh, for, for the people who are like wondering how the embargo works, like, uh, uh, to, to give a little bit more detail into it, like, even if the American government allows goods and supplies and commodities to get into Cuba, they still will, uh, take ships, lock them down for months at a time, a process that's actually very costly to the American government as well, for the record. Uh, whether it be like legal battles that they consistently have to fight or just like literally holding ships under uh, lockdown for an extended period of time. And then they'll allow uh, these ships to potentially go through after checking all the cargo sh like that. So there's, uh, it it's not, it's not necessarily it, like whenever people say, oh, well, medical supplies are allowed through, you have to remember that like there's still a significant setback there. And not only that, but it's also completely unacceptable. And the world leaders and other nations who uh, are, are so used to turning a blind eye to atrocities uh, committed by Western imperialist nations, even they find this to be completely unacceptable, with the exception of Israel and the United States of America. Uh, all other countries uh, have, have uh, asked the United States to lift the embargo on Cuba. Totally. And, and it's also sort of worth mentioning, I think, that like there is a sort of longstanding uh, tradition. There's like a more moderate wing of, you know, what could be called like like the Cuban, the Cuban American community um, that believes very strongly that like the you know, there is a like, you know, once we end the embargo, you know, we're going to win over Cuba to capitalism, you know, in, a, in some sort of good faith fashion. And I think that like there is just sort of like, you know, there's a reason that there are people who tout that line. And it's because like, yeah, if you just ended the embargo, this thing that would be actually be like this huge drain of resources would go away. But I think that, you know, this is where it gets into the question of like, well, then why does this thing exist? Right? Like if, if it doesn't actually accomplish the goal of, you know, I mean, as of yet over 60 years in dislodging the Cuban revolution, and it, you know, is, is not something that is economically productive under in any defensible terms um you know the, the 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 why is the embargo in place and this whole infrastructure against cuba in place it's because the like you know for example there's tv marti or the national endowment for democracy which are american government funded institutions um tv marti and radio marti are florida-based media outlets that are staffed but they're basically I've, I've described them like this before they are make work programs for miami cubans um, to broadcast propaganda that nobody listens to. But, you know, one of the guests that I've interviewed, this uh, this guy who's actually the lawyer for Elian Gonzalez's father um, in 1999, uh -huh. um, he, uh, <clears throat> he, uh, like, uh, he, he told me that there was this, as he described it, like a, a Miami distortion field. 
and that you know there is this cottage industry and this incredibly influential uh like very in, in, in a very visible public way and there are obviously you know other interests are the, the you know they're like they're not the only interest on this and i don't want to portray any of this as like a you know it's monocausal but like there is a cottage industry that exists in a cuba lobby you know like they want the embargo to exist and, and you know this is not an unheard of tradition you know for example in 1962 after the Bay of Pigs, a bunch of, you know, the, the majority of the most hardcore Miami Cubans, um, the majority of them actually, said that they did not want the U.S. government negotiating for the return of the 1,500, the 1,000 plus people that the uh, Cuban government had captured after the Bay of Pigs. Because they, you know, they thought that like negotiating for the release of, you know, their brothers, sons, fathers, etc., um, was a sign of accommodation. So, you know, th this is a very, very hard line group of people in terms of the costs that they're willing to incur, you know, and that's not even getting into the acts of terrorism that like that they that they have been a part of and operated in concert with the American government, um, you know, in the decades since. Yeah. Um, what do you have to say to people that uh, claim that uh, uh, Cuban Americans that have these incredibly reactionary takes are representative of the plight that Cubans are going through in Cuba right now beyond what you just described. Yeah, I think that it's a, you know, like there, there, there's a couple of different challenges there. The first of which is that it's like there is a, a version that's not just from, you know, Cuban Americans, right? But it's from like the whole media that is just a narrative, which is that like Cubans are denied a bunch of freedoms and America to its to positive end is calling for Cubans to be given those freedoms. And there's this discontent on the streets and so on and so on. And, you know, another part of that narrative and, and the way that we're able to establish, you know, the, the fact supposedly, uh, that's the first part of that, which is about like, you know, what it, what is, what are these freedoms that are taken away? Um, the way in which that is framed as presented by, you know, the Cuban exiles is, is often just incorrect or it, it misguided. Um, you know, I think that, for example, the very existence of, you know, outlets dedicated to pro putting out propaganda for the overthrow of the Castro regime, in addition to many of the ongoing, you know, very active and publicly, and, you know, like, like acknowledged anti-Castro efforts uh, that are underway, uh, that are underway, um, you know, taken by the American government. Um, I, I just, it, to me, I guess it's... Uh, you know, there there is a a way in which it's like the 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 community of people who are often most trying to say because of my experience, you know, this this and this Castro and that are often the people who, when you look at what that experience is, you know, they're they're the people who participated in or end up supporting, um, you know, what I think are some of the really, uh, you know straight up darker chapters of of the cuban american history and i think that that to me you know the the weaponization uh by the american government of the cuban american community is you know a conversation that's long since passed and you know i i, I as somebody who's reported in the past on you know the pro-israel lobby for jewish publications it's a kind of like diaspora politics that felt very familiar to me um when brendan and i were digging into this subject um would you say that they're batista supporters because that's the part yeah. that often people leave out is the is this notion that the Cuban Revolution was incredibly violent, horrible, and Cuba in the aftermath suffered greatly, but they neglect to mention what Cuba looked like before the Cuban Revolution and uh, before Fidel Castro's regime and uh, how oppressive and incredibly violent it was at the behest of American capital owners, whether it be uh, the mafia with casinos or whether it be uh, just rich people in general that took advantage of plantations in Cuba and the slavery. This is something that rarely ever gets mentioned. So um, I think it's important to, to mention that as well. Uh, the, the, like what preceded uh, the, the Castro administration. So, you know, it's a really, you brought up one really important point, which is about like, you know, like how violent was the Cuban revolution? And, and there is this memory of, you know, like, you know, a bunch of like, you know, middle-class shopkeepers alongside, you know, the landed gentry being lined up in the street and shot. And that's just not how it went. Um, in fact, the, you know, and this is something that we talk about in the episode that's available this week, Lois Simos, um, 
you know, or, or no, actually, this will be in next week's episode. But the Cuban Revolution was not actually as violent as the 1933 uh, coup, which the American government had, you know, officially been okay with, which actually saw the rise of Batista um, for the first time in the 1930s, and uh, and the fall of uh, the Cuban dictator Machado. And so I think that like it's you know you're you're absolutely right to say that like yes, like there's this kind of uh, I think a, a fake memory that exists in American culture and in American in American popular perception about what the Cuban Revolution was there, and then simultaneously, um, you know, like to that point, I think one of the things that is uh, really you know sort of I think uh, I guess like underemphasized in this also is that like the revolution itself in the July 26 movement was a diverse thing. You'll find a lot of people, you know, who are, you know, some of the most later uh, vociferous anti-Castro, anti-Cuban revolution uh, or counter-revolutionary straight up. Um, they began as, you know, supposed fellow travelers of Castro um, and, and, and or at least of the Cuban revolution, because, you know, in, in large part, when Batista fell, you know, the country, as you were saying, you know, it, it was deeply unequal. It was it was totally broken. And the fact that it had fallen and that the Americans had not lined up a sure thing by the time Batista fell, you know, to replace him as they had in the past was sort of like a, a black eye. Like the, the, the state of Cuba was just so obviously uh, screwed up in terms of how impoverished the countryside was and how unequal Havana was and, you know, the, 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 the rampant corruption, the presence of American gangsters and so on. And so after the revolution, the, you know, begins, so from, you know, 1950 into 1960, you know, up until the Bay of Pigs, you know, over the course of that, you know, I guess two years almost, um, but really less than two years, you know, 18 months functionally, uh, you have a lot of, you know, Cubans leaving the island and you have a lot of people who are, you know, going to the United States um, or you have a lot of, and, and, and so but with the encouragement of the United States, you know, there's, there's a CIA plot to scare Cubans into sending their children to the United States called Operation Peter Pan. And the idea of, you know, just sort of um, like uh, the, once again, I, I, I get so deep in this, I, I lose where I am. Um, but I guess the, the to, to bring it back a little bit, um, I guess the thing that I would sort of uh, emphasize about where the, like, uh, the memory of how violent the revolution is, and uh, is, you know, important to dispel is to suggest about, like, you know, the, the people that we sort of, you know, weaponize and who are Batista cronies that we weaponize later. That's what I was getting to. The Batista cronies who are, I mean, for, who, who at all, or uh, sorry, both Batista cronies and former fellow travelers of the revolution, they do end up joining forces and, and they're both, you know, part of the brigade 2506 and so on. So it's like there are many people who will say, yeah, you know, I was one of the liberal revolutionaries, but then Castro, he went commie. And it's like, well, you know, what was it? What do you mean when you say he went commie? Do you mean that he nationalized the land in ways that were unfavorable to the corporate interests and, you know, like thus sort of induced a natural showdown with the United States, which previously got to treat Cuba like its plaything? You know, I like it's uh, I just have a hard. I think that when people when confronted with the facts about that kind of thing are, are sort of hard put to defend it. And, and so they're forced to sort of uh, mischaracterize what the revolution was and what it meant when it took place. I want to I want to qualify something here as well to the people who consistently talk about the number of deaths under the Cuban Revolution or under the Castro regime which was uh uh I guess around for what 60 plus years 60 years and um in comparison to the casualties under Batista for the period in time that Batista was in power which was 7 years give or take was, uh, according to the CIA, at the very least, 20,000 people. Whereas the Cuban Castro regime has never come anywhere near that number. In, in even like, even the most aggressive anti-communist propaganda outlets like the Black Book uh, uh, will, will mention that throughout a 60-year duration, throughout a 60-year duration, the highest estimate that is totally, like, ridiculous that even other anti-cuban uh anti-castro uh outlets do not agree with and and put at like a third of that is still fifteen thousand over the course of 60 years versus twenty thousand over the course of seven so and you know we when we interviewed cubans for our show you know and, and i was going to say earlier that um I, we were able to talk with marta nunez sarmiento 
um, who is a Cuban like sociologist and feminist uh, scholar who we interview a bunch for the show. And she gave us a message uh, that I kind of wanted to pass along and, and sum up briefly how she characterized it from on the ground. Um, but I think that, you know, it's 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 the like the sheer like the, the, the incongruity of those numbers is is really striking. And even still, you know, when you talk to Cubans and, and people who live in Cuba, they're willing to say like, yeah, like there are, you know, things that like shortcomings of the Cuban revolution and shortcomings of our society. Um, it's just that like, you know, and, and this is, I think, like a very good, it's part of why I think like the issue of Cuba, it can be a really good way to sort of help people, you know, think about like reorient their perspective about American action abroad more generally, right? Because it's like, well, hold on, what right do we have to tell this country to arrange its society in a different way? And 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 what is the society that they want to build, and why are we so opposed to it? Um, and, and you know, Cuba presents that uh, because of its success, uh, you know, because of the success it has had, you know, it's it's a it would be a very dangerous thing for people to hear about it. Yeah, it's uh, it's a similar. It's a similar problem with like the inception of the Haitian Revolution as well. Like America has historically hated uh, any sort of activity in the islands that were considered revolutionary because they were worried that like uh, marginalized communities in the United States of America would see that, notice it, and also want to tailor their own movement. It's a, uh, it's like a. It's it's not a war necessarily out of uh, a genuine like national security concerns but rather that this ideology uh if if uh, mirrored here in the united states by marginalized people in a similar fashion could be greatly damaging to the current hierarchy of power so that is a, a part of the reason why america has always been involved in cuba and also even in haiti yeah and then um to pull up the thing that uh, marta sent um because i do think it was really impressive but here's how she you know described it um and i'm quoting from here here you know yesterday there were strangely rage outbursts at the same time in different cities and criticizing blackouts lack of food and existing stores uh in hard currency so meaning that like it's difficult um it's difficult for people to get the currency to buy uh goods they need and that social media has broadly shown these things and it's true that we are all exhausted after 16 months of the pandemic, plus the previous months of the worsening blockade since August 2019. And this is an important point. A lot of the recent difficulty that Cuba was facing even before the pandemic was because of uh, intensified blockade and, uh, or, you know, intensified economic uh, and diplomatic measures against Cuba taken by the Trump administration. Part of this was just because of the Havana syndrome, and part of this was because when you get a Republican pre presidency, you can be, you know, like, you can assume they'll do something bad um, beyond the normal b level of badness that one would expect, I guess, as the mean. Um, and so uh, I, I think Marta want, also wanted to note, and this is the last thing I want to say, was that, you know, she personally links these with the uprisings with the events in Hades. And, and I want to be very careful about framing that, because I think it's just to say that, like, there, you know, we don't have a lot of facts and things are all very fluid. But, you know, the Caribbean, and this is a whole region of the world. And, you know, America, like, you know, if you look at the New York Times front page today, Cuba in this story was not even at the top, you know, just a couple hours ago. It was still the assassination of the leader of Haiti in a plot that involves, you know, uh, Haitian Americans and people with ties to mercenary companies and the whole lot. And, you know, all of it reeks very much of Venezuela uh, and, the, and that stunt under the, in the Trump years. So I think it's it's like the, the key point of which is to say I don't want to insinuate anything beyond that like people should be really reading this stuff with like a close and skeptical eye because as you know Marta's pointing out like you know you know they, they live there and this kind of coordination and 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 so on it, she's not characterizing it as strange because Cuba is you know this uh, totalitarian regime where nobody's allowed to think you know it, it is not like it, it has stricter rules and free speech and free association than we do in America for fucking sure but you you know, even there, they you know they're raising questions about this stuff as well, especially there. Yeah. Um. How do you think? How do you think Cuba will deal with this? Do you have any opinion on that, or if it's outside of your scope, it's fine as well. I, I, I mean, mean, I'm I, seeing, I, I, I'm seeing like propaganda. Like I, I am seeing immediately like what we always see. And you mentioned the New York Times. It's not like the headline, but. Immediately, Biden calls uh, Cuba protests clarion 
call for freedom. Like, I mean, yeah, they are the, the, Bi the Biden. The, the problem is that like, it's, you know, the fact that like Biden, I think is the one, you know, that he is making an active statement is not a good, like it's, it's really, it's not good. Um, and it's unfortunate because obviously that will only like, you know, that like Biden puts out a statement, it emboldens other people. Like it, it's, it's not, it's not good. It does not mean, however, like anything about what the situation is on the ground because Biden could be calling these, you know, it's, it's like, what's, what's Biden's motivation? Like, we don't know. Um, and, and we don't have like reporting to anything to that effect yet, but it's like, ah, well, you know, Biden is like, you know, like has to give a shit about a lot of, you know, he's, he's trying to get an infrastructure bill through. He's got a lot of domestic, you know, this is another thing to think about with, you know, like, uh, that I guess this thing that we've said in blowback before, and it's a, a phrase I'm twisting from a thing that I read once written by the journalist, Patrick Coburn, which is about the ways in which American domestic political priorities will change American foreign policy outcomes and decisions and actions and so on. And so, you know, it's like, why is Biden doing all this? Like, it could be that he wants to, you know, spur Cuban democracy on and so on. It could also be that he sees Marco Rubio getting, you know, antsy in, on Twitter about it. And now he has to do something about it. So I, I think that it's part of what's important is to not like, you know, not there's not like we should we should be concerned. But like, I, I'm not like exuding frenzy. And as to what Cuba's doing next, you know, I would look at what, um, you know, Prime Minister, uh, sorry, Pre uh, President um, Miguel Diaz-Canel said today, there's a Telesor article, I'll just send it to you, that summarizes his remarks pretty well. Um, and I think that it's it's good to sort of like, you know, like try and go to the source uh, with some of these people in terms of just like seeing what the, you know, Cuban ministers and people are saying today. Um, and, you know, I think that American media, because we'll call stuff, you know, you know, like authoritarian and we use those words not to actually describe a system in an honest or, or, or nuanced way, but because it's a way to negate and treat anything that they might say as suspect. And, you know, it's, it's sort of like, you know, the challenge to everybody is to kind of like see past that and push past that to try and, you know, like consider the perspective of the country that we are nakedly launching such a brutal campaign against. Yeah. Um, by the way, uh, with respect to the Cuban protests, uh, the United States appropriations budget just allotted $20 million to the democracy projects in Cuba. Uh, and uh, of the funds made available pursuant paragraph, not less than 5 million shall be made available for programs to support free enterprise and private business organizations, people to people, educational and cultural activities, and for purposes of paragraph two, the activities described in paragraph shall be considered democracy programs pursuant to section 7032C of this act, except that none of the funds made available under such paragraph may be used to assist this, uh, may be used for assistance for the government of Cuba. So the irony uh, of a lot of uh, Americans trying to weaponize the protests that are happening right now, which are legitimate, it seems. Uh, I don't think it's like every time a fucking protest occurs in a country that America considers, uh, or that leftists consider to be like socialist or socialist adjacent, is adjacent, I don't immediately go, oh, CIA op, okay? I do think that people are probably frustrated. But the people are not demanding, please privatize our industries immediately. I would like to, instead of uh, rely on the government, I would like to rely on fri uh, free enterprise uh, and, and capitalism. They want more government help. That's what they're protesting. They're protesting for government help. Now, some of them might be protesting for a free enterprise or what they understand is going to be more beneficial for them, but they want fucking food. They're not saying like, you know, end communism. Because when you're hungry and you want more food, you're not going to be thinking about the ideological uh, uh, disagreements that you might have with the current government that you exist under. You just want fucking food. Um, yeah. So uh, interesting that America is giving $20 million again to democracy programs in Cuba. And those programs are to support free enterprise and private business organizations. And that's, by the way, just the money that is, you know, on the books for what it's worth. Um, you know, I, I think that like what I one thing I would want to emphasize also is that, you know, there is a lot of dark money swirling around this stuff at all times. Um, I'll give one example. Um, I like, I, I don't think it's necessary to like name the group, um, just offhand, but like 
there uh also just because it's like you know alphabet soup but you know the the group for example this past uh february a bunch of you know bob menendez and a bunch of other political heavyweights uh rafael diaz Balart, the mayor of miami although it should be noted being the mayor of miami is not like being the mayor of new york the mayor of miami is a more figurehead position so uh that guy just is like his his job is to just be annoying on, on in the media um at which he succeeds marvelously uh and you know, they, they had this event in February and Bob and Enda streams in or whatever. And the guy who organizes it is a lawyer in private practice. And, you know, I look up his foundation and it's not a, it's not a registered nonprofit. It doesn't file anything about who it's disclosed to, you know, like you have these groups that operate, you know, seemingly large institutions and that are connected to, you know, groups that do nakedly take money from the national endowment for democracy. The, the thing, the fun, like, um, one of the, like, you know, funding measures that's approved in the government, much like the one, uh, illustrated in the, um, uh, in the, in the tweet you have up on the screen. And so it's like, there's this, you know, like, like, I, I guess the way to put it is that it's like, you know, we, we have all these, you know, like, like connections that we see the surface right here and in the, in the language of the legislation, but it's not the whole picture. And, uh, you know, we're not getting the whole like picture of it. And that, you know, should be a point of concern. Um, I think, you know, it's because, it, you know, it's dark money affects all parts of American political life. So there is like, you know, it's to the point about like, you know, not immediately assuming every protest is American astroturfed and so on. It's also like, you know, we should look at, you know, and try to make a point of seeing and I hope that, you know, journalists are in the next com in the coming days uh, are making the same kind of scrutiny of, you know, what are the American operations like, you know, active in these countries that might have some relationship. I'm, I'm sure going they'll on. do that, actually. Oh, I think 100%. I think Glenn Greenwald is too busy. Uh, I don't know, uh, getting mad at like a like a trans anarchist on Twitter to maybe offer some coverage to things like that. But, you know, those are more important subjects to cover, if you ask me. So I think uh, that's 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 what we're doing with like the left adjacent best uh, investigative reporters on the left. Um, yeah. So who who knows? But I I yeah. certainly am not uh, waiting on Jake Tapper to or uh, anyone at CNN or MSNBC to offer broad coverage to American democratization programs in Cuba. I mean, it is going to be, I think, a very like it's you know. Uh, this is a political issue that like is very difficult to talk about historically because people don't know the truth right like it would be a lot easier to defend the cuban revolution if we said hey uh it turns out fidel castro was not eating babies um they were actually teaching people to read and we tried to kill the people teaching poor people to read uh because we did not like the way in which they nationalized um industries and so on like you know to make it a little you know like that's like the cocktail napkin version of this or whatever um and i think once you start presenting people with the truer version of events and you tell them well no this is what actually happened and in and you know it it it, it helps form the basis for a better understanding of like well why do things work the way they do today um because it's it's you know I mean, I, I guess to me, it's it's like these sorts of like it's all this like subterfuge and like, you know, like uh, what I can only describe as like this, you know, dark energy that's meant to cast a shadow over all this. Um, you know, I guess one of the advantages, of the, you know, I am fundamentally very optimistic about people's ability to kind of like see past the bullshit and, and, and really see the reality of the situation. And, you know, I'm I'm not optimistic about the Democratic Party or anything, but like. I believe in the capacity of people to force unwilling people with power to do stuff. And, you know, I, I think that there are millions of people in Cuba whose lives, you know, uh, would be a lot better off for it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, Noah, thank you so much for coming on, brother. You were, this was a absolute treat. A lot of people are saying you're a tanky and that, uh, you know, you're not a, an incredible source of information. I'm just kidding. Some people are saying that in the chat. What do you have to say to them? Uh, it, I have to say to them, Blowback Season 2 is now available on all podcasts, uh, podcasts, not podcasts, uh, airing weekly. If you want to listen to the whole show, stitcher.com slash premium, sign up for a monthly plan, use the promo code blowback. Um, but Hell otherwise, yeah. you know, Monday mornings, it'll be in your feeds. And um, if you have complaints, don't send them to me. Just kidding. Uh, I am Senator grateful Brandon? for anybody who listens. <laughs> Senator Brandon? Um, and what, what about Brandon? I'm saying send him to Brandon instead. No, I, I, 
I want to give him a break. He's 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 done a lot this season. Like his soundtrack, it, it fucking bangs, and that's also going live on the thirtieth. So I'm I'm very much excited to also have that out in the world too. Okay, uh, yeah, and and uh, yes, as uh, Noah already mentioned, you can find Noah at N. Oh, wait, how do you, dude? I I always fuck it's, up. Your uh, name. Yeah, I'm just on on at N K U L W. Yeah, it's really good, really uh, really easy to remember. Uh, Twitter name you got there, Noah. Once upon a time, there was a character limit that mattered, and the ats were included in it. And so, I guess this zoomers won't re your 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 audience probably doesn't remember this era. Because they wouldn't use Twitter then, like yeah, they don't 140 use it now. character era. Yeah, and so I, you know, I, I, I don't think I've ever been accused of not being long-winded. Uh, so naturally, <laughs> I had to make space for my long-ass tweets. Okay, well, people are spamming it right there. You can find them there. You can find them on Blowback. Blowback season one was about Iraq, and Blowback season two, which is out now, is about Cuba and uh, American propaganda, American involvement in Cuba, uh, and. Uh, you know, his microphone will be better on the podcast, so don't worry about that. Definitely check that out. Thank you for coming on, uh, Noah. Thanks. All right, peace, brother. Peace. Okay, that was Noah Colwyn, uh, friend of the show, Noah. Um, he's great. I, I know that uh, chat was uh, mostly focusing on all the wrong things, as usual. Uh, hyper focusing on dumb shit like uh, the microphone or whatever, or attacking other chatters. But I hope some of you, at least out of the 30,000 people that were in here the entire time, I hope some of you actually learned a thing or two.